Welcome to Canonical. I'm James Xiao, and I'm joined by Ia Darris and Sam Spieler. Hey. Hey. Hi, guys. Today we are continuing our Postmodern Novels of the South series with The Moviegoer by Walker Percy. Our previous books for the series were A Confederacy of Dunces by John Kennedy Toole and Swamplandia by Karen Russell, which you can find in our archives. Since this is a review, we won't reveal any spoilers. If you haven't read the book yet, keep on listening. If you want to join our discussion, you can find our book club on Reddit by searching for a Canonical Pod. And if you would like to support us and your local bookstore, you can use our bookshop.org link, which is in our episode description. At our bookshop store page, you can find the books for our book club and other books that we recommend. We are also on social media at Canonical Pod. Next week, we will be having an in-depth discussion of The Moviegoer with author and publisher John Seeley. We hope you'll join us for that episode as well. Yet, since this is your pick for our series, why don't you give us a quick summary of what the book is about? The Moviegoer is the National Book Award winning 1961 debut novel by Southern writer Walker Percy. And the novel follows the life of the main character, Jack Balling, who's known to most people as Binks. Uh, Binks is a Korean war vet, and he's become a stockbroker later in his life. He lives a very comfortable but disconnected life, surrounded by his family in New Orleans. And the novel follows him through a particularly transformative period of his life, something that he calls the search. And the novel culminates with an important event happening on Ash Wednesday. For me, I think I enjoyed the book because of what I had heard about the book before I picked it up. I think if I had picked it up without any of the reviews or commentary being there, I wouldn't have responded to it the way that I did. I think I needed at least a little bit of a a warm-up to kind of let me know what to look for and what to expect. That makes sense. I didn't know anything about it going into it and I enjoyed it, but it wasn't until I started doing some research afterward that it had a lot more meaning. You know what? I felt the same way. I found it extremely difficult to get through the beginning of the book. And instead what I did, which is something I almost never do, is I went and read reviews of this book. Oh, before even completing it? Yeah, I, I think I was probably a third through, and I just thought, like, wh- what is going on here? Like, why did this book win these awards, or why is he so highly regarded? And I went and read reviews about it. And I hate doing that, because I want to enter the reading experience with a blank slate, but I suppose I already did enter it with a blank slate, and I wanted to just, like, clear the slate again. My initial impressions of the book was... Not negative, but just I just found it really hard to get into. Hmm. Well, is that a, a slight to us as readers or a slight to the novel? Because I think you would hope for a novel to be able to engage a reader as a self-contained unit without any supplemental material necessary. Yeah, I mean, I guess this is sort of a backhanded comment about how the book is not engaging, but I found the book to not be engaging at the start. Yeah, I agree with that. I think that Percy, in the beginning of the novel, he doesn't really establish any stakes. It's not clear why what Binks is doing is important. It becomes clear later on, but at first, you don't really understand why you're seeing any of these things. Well, and at the beginning, it's mostly him musing about things. There's not a whole lot of action. There's not a whole lot of action In the book in general, if by action we're talking about big events, most of them are smaller, quieter events. And yeah, the first half, or at least the first third, is a lot of musing on his part before he starts to involve other characters. I think that's interesting that we read this a few weeks after we read A Confederacy of Dunces, because I see a lot of parallels there in terms of the main character. They are not that similar, and yet they're both kind of aimless people who would rather be left to their own devices, but those devices are very different. Yeah, I agree. The novel is Binks. You spend so much time in his head, and I think that Percy really wanted to focus your attention on 
the way an individual person relates to the world that he finds himself in. And his perspective is important. It makes or breaks the book. So if you find him very charming, you'll like the book. And luckily for me, I found him quite charming. But I could definitely see how another reader would find him particularly tiresome. There are some mechanical issues in the beginning of the novel that I think Like I said, they should have been worked through just to make the themes of the novel, which are important and very significant, they should have been brought to the fore earlier. But once we kind of got moving, I did find that there were some interesting things going on in the novel. And I found that Percy's prose style was actually quite good. It was playful and interesting, and at times it was very beautiful. Here I'm thinking specifically in the middle of the novel when Binks takes a trip to Chicago. The description of Chicago in that passage I thought was really well done and really beautiful. Uh, The biggest problem that I have, even bigger than the beginning of the novel, is that it is a philosophical novel. And it requires, I think, some outside reading and outside thinking to really engage with it and to understand some of the ideas that really make this novel significant. And in my opinion, the philosophical novel shouldn't be like a Romana Clef, a novel with a key where you have to know one thing in order to unlock the novel. That's kind of the case here. I think for me, the kind of high watermark for a philosophical novel would be something like Camus the Stranger, where When you know more about Camus and you know more about existentialism, the novel becomes even richer. But even without knowing those things, the novel still has something to offer. And that's the thing that I think was really missing from this novel. I think I agree. It's definitely still enjoyable without knowing the philosophical ideas behind it, but it's not as significant without knowing those things. I read it all the way through without really any issues and enjoyed it, but there wasn't much significance for me. And I was struggling with what, what I was going to bring to this discussion until I started reading other people's writings about this book. So Ian, you said that you found the character charming. What did you find charming about him? I think for most people with character identification, part of it is seeing something of yourself in him. And part of it is also seeing that his reaction to the world is unique and it's not contrived. And it was against kind of stereotype. There is a stereotype of the antisocial outsider, alienated sort of person being very down on certain things, being very down on money, being very down on family, being very down on very conventional things. But Binks isn't like that. He is an outsider. He is disconnected. But he's, at the beginning of the novel, very much in touch with his family. He cares deeply for his family. And he cares very much for popular culture. And he cares very much for other people and for money. So he does seem like a very well-adjusted person. Yet at the same time, he was an outsider. And that to me was very striking. I don't think I've encountered a character like him before. I also found him charming, but kind of cautiously so for the same reasons. I did see parts of myself in him or vice versa. And that actually bothered me because he is very likable, but he has some problematic ideas about things, partly because of when this was written, but also partly just because of his character. Uh, Percy does a good job of making this character someone that, or at least someone that I enjoyed getting to know, someone that I could see even being close with. But the things that I found problematic, the the way he treats women specifically, made me kind of look at (laughs) how I view people, how I interact with others. And, you know, I I looked back on certain things in my past and thought, hmm, is this what it looks like from the outside? I can see that, especially because he does have a series of love interests and they're all his secretary. Yeah. That to me seems kind of tacky, but it's just a product of the times, you know? 
Sure. Not, but not just the fact that they are his secretaries. If he were pursuing them genuinely, that's one thing. But he knows from the outset that these are not relationships that are going to last. Well, that's okay, Sam. We're not living in Puritan America. No, but he is also not upfront about that. Well, James, I want to ask you because you asked me why I found him charming. And I noticed that you tend to only ask me a direct question <laughs> when you disagree with me. So come on out with it. Um. Well, I... I guess that I don't disagree with you. I just didn't find him charming, but I didn't think he was uncharming. I just found the whole endeavor, the whole first half to two thirds of the novel, extremely boring. I could not relate to him at all. And what it reminds me of actually is Catcher in the Rye, because I think a lot of people really relate to Holden Caulfield. And I couldn't when I read Catcher in the Rye in high school. And I think people who love this book really relate to Binks, and I couldn't relate to him. I think there are a number of issues. One, he's this kind of landed gentry figure, and I, I'm not very sympathetic to him because of that. I, I think it's unfair, but you know, I can't really relate to a guy who's has life handed to him, essentially. Sam, you said you imagined that you could be friends with him. I don't think I could be, because I think he would be the kind of person who... By reading this book, you know, he doesn't actually want to be friends with you. He will be right. pleasant with you and he will use you because it amuses him. But I don't think he wants to be friends. He doesn't have any deep, meaningful relationships with anyone except for Kate. And then even with Kate, I don't want to give away the ending, you know, but with Kate, I, I have some serious questions about what's going on there. It's not that I think he was not charming, like he was an odious figure. I just didn't relate to him, and I didn't think of him very positively. I didn't think of him very negatively. I, I just didn't think of him as anything interesting at all, to be honest. Friends is maybe a strong word, um, but I saw a lot of myself in him, and that was one of the things that endeared me to him, but also one of the things that I found troubling. Sam, do you need help? No, I'm good. So are you telling me, Sam, that we are not actually friends? You're just using me for your own amusement? Shit. Thanks a lot, Ed. <laughs> now it's out. I did think of Catcher in the Rye, though, as well. Not immediately, but because of some of the things I read about this book. I am glad I read this book now and not as a 20-year-old or teenager. One, I, I would not have gotten the philosophical things behind this, uh, probably just because I wouldn't have looked anything up about it. But also, I think I would have learned the wrong lessons. I think I would have looked up to this character or seen something good in him rather than something troubling. I think a teenager would read the first two pages and then throw the book across the room. <laughs> yeah. And I actually, when I finished, went back to read the first five pages or so because I thought the last uh, third was really strong. And I, I was totally invested. And when I finished, I was like, I got to see why I didn't like this at the beginning. And I read the first five pages. And I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah, this is why. Because <laughs> all the stakes that were in the last third were not at all present in the first couple of pages. I also feel uncomfortable with the power structures throughout the novel. I think there are universal themes here, but it feels dated because of how race and gender are portrayed here and how he's someone who's very obviously privileged and he acts in a way that makes me reading it in 2020 makes me feel uncomfortable. Right. I, I agree. I think that reading this novel, knowing that it has a, a sort of philosophical message behind it, you're inclined to think that Binks at the end of the novel is living his best life and what he's doing at the end of the novel is something that Percy endorses. And I am not sure if I can get behind that, but I think we can talk more about this next week with uh, our guest, John, because I do think that it might be possible to disconnect those things from the novel and just enjoy the novel without that kind of baggage of endorsing behavior one way or the other. So I should reveal my bias here. 
I don't like philosophical novels. And the reason why I don't like philosophical novels is I think that in order for the author to fully explore the philosophy that he wants to explore, the character has to act in a way that's not psychologically consistent with how I understand humans to act. The author needs to manipulate characters to create some kind of message or idea. I found it really hard to understand Binks psychologically in this novel. And I wonder if you guys felt the same way or you just thought, eh, it makes sense. He does not seem very psychologically consistent to me in the novel. I don't know exactly what you mean, but I will say that he felt overly cool. He's even tempered to an extreme. And I did have a problem with the switch at the end. He does have a change, but it felt very sudden to me. I think that... I can enjoy philosophical novels perhaps more than you can, James, because I view them as kind of a subspecies of allegory. And in allegory, I don't expect things to be consistent with the real world. I expect for things to be exaggerated to point to something or exaggerated for a certain effect. And well, I don't think that I have met anybody like Binks in my world I think that he's not inconsistent in and of himself. He's just an atypical person. And I think that it works for the novel because at the beginning of the novel, he is supposed to be living a, I guess you could call it an unhealthy lifestyle or a suboptimal lifestyle. Yeah. When I say he's not consistent, I guess I should say that at the beginning of the novel and the ending of the novel feels very different to me. And when I say the end, I guess I mean the last like 20 to 30 pages. They feel like two different people. That's what I mean by it feels inconsistent. I suppose you can earn that change with character development and perhaps good plotting, but I don't see it earned here. The other problem is that I don't see, and this goes to what you were saying, Yad, about it being a subset of allegory. And I agree. I, I think it is similar I think that the full range of human emotion is not expressed here. You never see him angry, right? You never see him feel any jealousy. Part of that is he never really struggles, except with, I suppose, a kind of depression and ennui. So he struggles with that. But you don't really see the full range of human emotion that I would like, because I feel like that's kind of the bare minimum to create a realist work. If it's not a realist work, then sure, no problem. But I think it is trying to be. Isn't that part of the point, though, is that he's aimless. He doesn't seem to have any real passions. But I see your point that he does seem like a an outline of a person for Percy to place all of his ideas into so that he can manipulate him like a clay figure. Similar to what you and he had already said, um, that's part of the point of a philosophical novel is the philosophy. But my issue with the philosophical novel is I think it can't purely be about philosophy. It still needs to be a a novel with characters and you have to strike that balance. And I got to say, I've, I don't think I've come across a philosophical novel that I think strikes that balance because I think by making it about philosophy, you have to automatically neuter the character to make him less than a 3D character. What I would say here is that I think the application matters. And I think that the application matters perhaps more strongly in 1961 when this novel was produced rather than now because I think this type of analysis of our contemporary condition is more common nowadays, but a lot of people have given this novel credit for being the first piece of fiction that has a very contemporary psychology, a very contemporary way of looking at the world that mirrors the way that modern men look at the world. You could say that this is exactly what earns its place as a postmodern novel because Binks's worldview is so postmodern. It's so mediated through film and through the appearances of things rather than things of the in and of themselves. But I do think that, you know, in 1961, this book was meaningful because it presented a an image, perhaps an exaggeration of modern man, but the first time that this type of image of modern man had been presented. And I think that it was 
perhaps very significant then and less significant now that we see this type of thing happening more often, this type of criticism of the way people live and the way people are in the world nowadays. Yeah, it's become kind of accepted nowadays that people lose themselves in media, right? Yeah, I I think that that's significant that it was perhaps the first time that it was done. And even though, like, you know, you guys were saying Kierkegaard exists and Kierkegaard did it first, it's significant to take Kierkegaard and apply him to our time. Yes. So even though it's not a new idea, connecting the dots means something to me, at least. I wonder if I'm just being too demanding, once again, you know, because it is a personal bias, but I wonder if I'm just being too demanding. Like, maybe it's not possible for there to be a philosophical novel that is a philosophical novel, but at the same time has characters that feel very real and not just a puppet for the author to enact his philosophical play. I think that there are certainly people who would agree with you. Um, I can imagine somebody saying that the philosophical novel just makes philosophy worse and novels worse at the same time. (laughs) Like it just ruins both things. For me, I think it works because I like philosophy on its own and I like novels on their own. And it's just like a combination of two things that I already like. I know that it dilutes the power of philosophy because it takes the abstract, which is easier to deal with in philosophy, and it confines it into the particular in a character. And by doing so, it ruins its power as the abstract And it makes the character not realistic, like you're saying. But at the same time, I'm willing to take that. I'm willing to sacrifice that realism because I want to play with these ideas. I think the ideas are interesting. I hear Ayn Rand has some choice books in this category. Oh, there you go. That's our recommendation of the day. America's favorite philosopher. (laughs) You got The Fountainhead. You got uh, Anthem, which is like sub-1984, sub-animal farm level, just pure moralizing. (laughs) Anyways, let's take a break. What do you think? Yeah, let's take a break. We'll be right back. Welcome back. Well, now that we've discussed all the pros and cons, I guess, of this novel and how I found it extremely slow, but maybe you won't, who would you guys recommend this novel to? I would recommend it to religious people who are serious minded. I think that those people have really responded well to Walker Percy. When I was doing research for these episodes, I found a lot of Catholics were really interested in Walker Percy. And if they don't already know him, I think that they would really enjoy reading his work. What do you think about atheists who want to better their lives? Do you think they would respond to this? It would hit them in a different way. I don't think that they would enjoy it in the same way, but I think that the novel can offer something to everybody. Yeah, I think it's a well-written book. I think the philosophical parts... (laughs) What James said, notwithstanding, are interesting, and I'm certainly not Catholic. The religious aspects that I'm sure we will go into much more next episode, they don't bother me, partly because it's philosophical in nature, and it's not a religious text, I would say, even though the philosophies are religious in nature. But I think the readership is much broader than just Catholics and Christian people, I don't think it provides answers. I think it provides a philosophy, but I don't think it gives any answers. For me, that's actually a saving grace 
because I hate philosophical novels that are also didactic, and this is not. So that's a point in the pros column for me. Would you recommend this to women? I wouldn't not recommend it to women, but I also wouldn't go out of my way to recommend it to women. Um, I mean, I think most people now would understand that this had a time and place. And as you were talking about before, that time and place is in the past. But there are good messages in here, even though there are some problematic ones, too. I mean, in interviews, actually, he'd been asked very specifically about this issue. And his response was that his concern is with the individual. And when he writes women in a certain way, or when he writes black people in a certain way, it's nothing to do with their nature or their presence in the world, but rather their presence to a certain person. So when we see these characters in the novel, I think Percy would like us to say, well, these are the way that they appear to Binks rather than the way that they actually are. It seems from what things I've read that he took pains to distance himself from Binks. Percy is not Binks. Yes. Binks is a character and I don't, I don't think you're supposed to look at him as a great person. Well, James, what about you? Would you recommend this book to anybody at all? Um, I mean, you know, if you're having trouble falling asleep, it's great. <laughs> it well, I, I I'm just kind of kidding here. I I do think it's an interesting read, uh, especially the second half, and I think it is something worth reading if you have the time. I would recommend it to people who are interested in philosophy because I think if you're not interested in philosophy, I don't think you would care that much about this book. Would you be willing to read more Walker Percy? Maybe no, because I've read that his other books are more didactic, and I think that would make me like him less, or at least like the books less. I would. Um, I think maybe of the three of us, I have the biggest taste for the philosophical novel. So I, I didn't love this book. I wasn't head over heels, but I feel like I have enough time in my life for a bit more Walker Percy. I would consider it. I I did enjoy this book, but <laughs> if his other books are more didactic, I don't know that I would be that into that. Okay, let's conclude here then. Thank you for listening. You can find our reading schedule on Reddit at Canonical Pod, where we post threads for our book club discussion every Wednesday. You can also find us on social media at Canonical Pod. And if you would like to support us in your local bookstore, once again, you can use our bookshop.org link, which is in our episode description. And via that link, you can find books for our book club and also other books that we recommend. We'll be back next week with our special guest, John Seeley, in an in-depth discussion of this book. If you're interested in joining that discussion, go ahead and read this book first. Till next time, happy reading. We'll talk to you soon. Mm-hmm.